biochar is a, to keep it simple, is a agricultural charcoal or horticultural charcoal. It's used to capture carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it back into the soil through uh, direct application. People are using it to go through animals as an animal feed supplement. Um, it has had over the years lots and lots of different uses, but our primary um, purpose is to sequester carbon and put it back into the soil. Okay, so what is the process of producing biochar? It's called pyrolysis. We're, ours is a very simple method. It's called a, a contiki or flame capped kiln style, where we slowly build a fire into the kiln, and as it rise, as the fire rises, it excludes the oxygen into the bottom of the kiln, which then pyrolyzes or cooks the, the wood, causing it to release its methane and carbon monoxide and all the noxious gases and they burn at the top of the kiln. Once they've stopped releasing the gases, you get to a stage in the kiln where you, where you load it again and start again. It's just layering, layering and layering of, of, of the feedstock. How long does that take? Or is it different for different types of wood? Yes, it varies with your feedstock. Uh, most of the wood we use is an acacia or a gum. Yep. We do use pine, that turn obviously burns quicker. You still get the same result. Uh, but it's it's all fallen timbers and things that prunings and stuff that people don't want. They don't want it for firewood. They don't want it in their garden or a farmer. In most cases, will pile it up in the paddock and set fire to it, and all the gas and smoke and everything goes into the air and adds it to the pollution. But it can be gr a bit green, yeah. Um, but as long as most of the moisture's out of it, oh, we've burnt it a week old. Yeah, right. But we're not talking great big round pieces of wood. We're talking nothing probably bigger than your wrist, generally. If I was um, someone who owned property in the Adelaide Hills and I had this idea that I wanted to produce biochar to put back into my pastures, I'd have to cut it up into small uh, forearm size pieces for you to yeah, do this with? Yeah, well, just long enough so they fit in the kiln. Yeah. And as the kiln, as the kiln, the kiln's tapered, so as you get higher in the kiln, you can make longer pieces. It's a matter of cutting it into lengths that are easier to stack and layer in the kiln. And Maggie Biochar is a non-for-profit initiative, is that right? That's Based correct. in Macclesfield. Yeah. Yep. How did that come about? Oh, uh, Brian Lewis, one of our founders, was had been toying with biochar for many years, and he came to me one day and said he'd like to start a biochar group in Macclesfield. I said, well, why don't we? So we just went from there, and over the last three, nearly four years, we've grown and built it up to 50 members, 14 of whom are active, who come to regularly to burns. Okay. Um, because we're a volunteer group and we burn primarily during the week, a lot of our members are working and all that sort of stuff. And, and can't get do out. you have just the one kiln, one trailer, or are no, there groups of you that go out? Yeah, no, we have five, five kilns, I think. We, have, we had a big one made two and a half years ago that's probably nearly two metres to 1.8 metres high. Right. Going down to our midi, what we call our midi kiln, which is around 1,200 high, and then a mini kiln, which is about 900 high, 900 square at the top and 300 square at so the bottom. So how big is the one we're looking at today? That's what they call the midi kiln. That's to uh, about uh, 1,200 high, 1,200 square at the top and 600 square at the bottom. Okay. On the taper. And are you finding um, there are more people in the Adelaide Hills looking to, to produce biochar? It's slowly growing. It's, okay. it's a matter of people being educated in what it is and what it does and the advantages of it. Okay. Can you tell us what you're doing for John and Tracy today at Littlewood Anchor Panthers Farm? What did, what did John come to you and ask for? Well, he's a part of your group, isn't he? He's a member of our group uh, and members can borrow kilns or whatever but okay. he's got a lot of dead wood and fallen timber on his pasture which he normally stacks up and sets fire to it. Right. He sees the advantages of biochar. There's a lot of things to sort out about how to get it into broad acres and things like that mm -hmm. but he's quite happy for us to come out, char it up, he'll keep the char and then he'll put it into his pastures. Mm. So do you leave it on property now? You yeah. dump it somewhere for want of a better... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We've got some bulker bags there that we fill up for him and then he'll cart them around and spread it as he wants. Okay. Excellent. So if our listeners are interested in finding out more about Mackie Biochar and the benefits to their properties and the greater environment, how do they get in touch with you? 
Where do they find more information? Um, Mackie Biohr uh, has a website. Yes. Uh, all the information you can find on there. Okay, and yeah. I'll list uh, list the link in our web in our on our website in our show notes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Excellent. Mackie Biochar only do raw biochar. They don't enhance or grade or anything like that. Well, that's a good question. So from this part of the process, what needs to be done next to get it into the ground or for, for it to be useful? Okay. In a small holding, like a, a gardener or something, or other, soak it in some fertiliser or you can buy um, microbes to mix with it put it in your compost, mix it with animal manures, and just put it in your soil. Okay. Uh, if you're preparing a bed, dig it in when you're digging the bed over. So it's pretty simple. It's very straightforward. Yeah, so yeah, we the, all need to get into doing this. Yeah, the, the, the problem is, and we hope to find out about this in the next couple of days, is getting it out onto Broadacre and what's the best way to broadcast it into Broadacre. Okay. It's a one-off application. You don't have to, you do it once and it's in the ground for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Wow. You've improved your soil, you've taken all that greenhouse gas out of the air and you're sequestering carbon in the soils, which is a very yeah. important part of, of good soil health. Absolutely. Look, thank you so much for your time today, Kelvin. I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I very much hope that there are more landowners in the Adelaide Hills that take you up on your biochar idea. Yeah. And look, if they want to buy their own kiln and make their own, we're more than happy to come out and do a, do a um, demonstration for them. Hi, John. Thank you for having me out here at the beautiful Littlewood Agapanthers Farm. How are you going to use it on your property? Well, uh, we're going to use it in two areas, but predominantly um, we're going to put it into the paddocks. That's the idea. Right. To put so it not into on the, the Agapanthers? No, probably not on the Agapanthers. They do very well, as you will. Yes, know, yes. Without, without any it. supplementation of almost mm. anything. Uh, even a, a little bit of water is about all they need. Yes. But no, we're going to put it into the paddocks for our hay production. Right. Uh, and uh, to see whether we can get improved productivity okay. out, of the, out of the soil with uh, lesser uh, inputs and lesser... So less fertiliser input fertilizer. because you're putting yep. in the biochar. That's right. So how are you going to get it out onto your paddocks? They're sort of chunks, aren't they? Yeah, they're chunks. And so we've got a, a spreader that I think should work. Uh, that, And we've tried it once now. And the raw biochar will go out. And we've done right. that. Um, and... We don't have to be highly scientific about it. We don't have to be, um, what's the word? We don't have to be exact with what we get out, but no. we want to get it out. Uh, and fairly with, evenly yeah, across yeah, evenly, the paddocks. Yeah, and yep. in fairly high amounts. Yeah, okay, because, so and yeah. how deep, and when you say high amounts, how, how do you work that out? Well, uh, it's uh, what, how, what carbon content do we want uh, down to a depth of, say, 300 mil. Okay. And hence, uh, then we know what volume over that, uh, yes. we're going to have and hence yes. how much carbon do we have to add given what we know we already have. So you're hoping to achieve better production in your pastures. Yep. What about the carbon side of things? Yeah, well, that's, I guess there are, it seems to be that there are many benefits that I can see and that's why it's so attractive to me because yes. it's not just a, a single a single benefit. The, the problem is with a single benefit, if it doesn't work, then you've lost everything. Whereas yes. at least when there are multiple benefits, so then if something doesn't work as well in, in those benefits, then you, you've still got a, you've still got a positive outcome. It's really good so, stewardship yeah. of the land. Yeah. And I, you know, I personally would love to see yeah. a lot more of it in yeah. the Adelaide Hills. Uh, I, there's just so many benefits mm. of um, carbon sequencing. Yeah. You know, into your yeah. properties. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, if we can get that carbon into the soil, even though we've got pretty good carbon content in our soils on this property, uh -huh. uh, as we've had them tested, uh, we could still take it up uh, a lot more. I'm not doing it to get uh, carbon credits or anything like no. that, uh, because that's a very costly process to to measure all of right. that. Right. Okay. But this is really about getting the productivity out of the yeah. improving the co productivity and decreasing the uh, cost of inputs, so predominantly you, fertiliser. Yeah, so you spoke uh, a bit before, off, uh, we weren't recording then, about a trial that's been done, um, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put the uh, the link and the results of that trial yep. into our show notes, because yep. it's really interesting as far as when when you add biochar and fertiliser into yep. pasture. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, you only have to add the, the biochar once. Once, yeah. The fertiliser then you can put in at a reduced rate, uh, well, I guess for ever after kind yeah. of thing. So uh, that's the real benefit of it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think that's wonderful. Yeah. So in what sort of time frame 
um, are we talking that you would decide whether it has been a success in yep. in pr improving your pastures, or is it an ongoing? Is it a 12 month, 18 yeah, month? Yeah, well, I mean, you'd, you'd, I, I would be looking to see some improvement if we put in uh, what we call inoculated charcoal. That is charcoal that's had some kind of uh, biological enhancement. That is mixing it with manure or uh, or or something else. And that's what you you're know, going to do. That's what we're going yep. to do before we spread it and get it inoculated and um, and then uh, rip it into the soil is what we'd like to do. Not. A method that some people might want to use, but that's what what okay. we'll do. Um, and I'd be looking at that uh, to get an improvement almost immediately. Yeah, right. Uh, meaning that following year, the the problem if you don't inoculate it is you use sometimes get a dip. This from the studies, you get a dip in in the in the productivity and then it ri rises the, the following year. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, look, if you're okay, I mean, we, we only live down the road from you, mm, but we right. might check in with you again uh, in six months' time yes. and see where you're going with it. Yep, that'll be great. Wonderful. Thank you here. so much for yeah. your time today, yeah. John. Thank you.